our presenter today is uh, Dr. Jeff Williams. And he has been with the college uh, as an adjunct since 2004 and as a full-time professor since 2006. She teaches everywhere um, in environmental science, philosophy, political science, and honors, but she has been chair of the environmental science um, department since 2016, and it's recently merged with sustainable agriculture in 2019. She has a lot of degrees, uh, two bachelors in life science and animal science. I believe I counted five masters in um, student counseling, <laughs> ecology and evolutionary biology, um, with two certificates on top of that, philosophy, curriculum and instruction and indigenous studies. She has a JD and a PhD. She is a PhD candidate in cultural anthropology. In terms of her research, uh, she is looking um, to establish the existence of and explore and analyze aspects of intercultural conflict between the Western scientific worldview in education and research and the worldview of indigenous peoples. And I did read that just so I would get it right. Okay. In particular, she's studying students of science, um, uh, indigenous peoples as students of science, as subject or other stakeholders of science and as scientists. And her research explores and critically examines proposed solutions to each of those. She's also a lecturer at the University of Kansas, Haskell Indian, Union, Haskell Indian Nations University, Washburn School of Law, and the KU School of Law. <coughs> she has served as a higher educational rep for the KNEA Board and the National Council of Higher Education Board, as well as serving on the American Wolf, found, the board for the American Wolf Foundation, uh, which is dedicated to the conservation of critically endangered, uh, the critically endangered red wolf. She also serves in the Asian Studies Development Program uh, Board and numerous other JCCC committees, including Honors Advisory Committee, Philosophy Club, um, Co-Advisor, Student Sustainability Committee, Faculty Advisor, and more. She is an avid reader, you know, in her spare time when she's not doing everything else. Uh, she loves to travel internationally and she has the best pictures of blue-footed birds from the Galapagos. It's, they're great. Uh, some of her favorites are uh, from Easter Island, Fiji, Petra, Jordan, the Galapagos, uh, Zanzibar, Morocco, and Tanzania. She hikes and spends time outside and she selected today's reading because she enjoys Wilson's style, the breadth of interdisciplinary knowledge, and she is a true believer in the subject. Um, and the book has greatly impacted her own academic journey. So without further ado, this is Dr. Williams, soon to be Dr. Williams. Thank you very much. So I'm unmuted, one task checked off. <laughs> Okay, so from the beginning, the first thing I want to do, um, I wasn't sure if I could see you and I know some of you and I don't know some of you. Before I get too far, if you could in the chat box, could you type in your major if you're a student or your um, discipline area if you teach so that I have a sense of how diverse um, the uh, audience is and their um, per perspectives. So, um, I'm going to actually, I, I do have this problem when I teach. I have all of everybody's little faces in the way. So I'm going to move us all out of the way <laughs> and get to um, introducing the book that I will talk about today. It's Consilience Unity of Knowledge by E.O. Wilson. And I need to thank a lot of people because it takes a village to put one of these projects together, particularly when uh, it's Zoom delivery. Um, you can see, obviously, Maureen and Michael, I thank you so much for inviting me to talk about a book that I I do really enjoy um, talking about, and I will show you in many places how it has influenced my own thinking and my own academic journey. I have to thank video services. I, I, I apologize in advance. I, 
I received several um, emails from these folks. Hopefully I got the information to you in time, but I was developing uh, new ideas about what to include up till about 30 minutes ago. So <laughs> this is the, the final version that I sent you hopefully is uh, near final, but you might see a, a slide or two new. But Barrett, Libby and Sarah, thank you so much for your help with video services. Uh, Jody, I haven't met you, but I've had these e email exchanges with you. I look forward to meeting you. Um, Carrie, thank you for your live captioning. And of course, Susan and JCCC Marketing who together uh, help promote um, this talk so that I could have the audience that I have today. So I'm very thankful for the group of people that made this project happen. So one of the places to start, of course, is to think about who E.O. Wilson is um, as the author of this book. Um, he has a very, very lengthy resume, and I tried to pick out some things that I found about him that might give you some context of the insights that you read if you read the book. Um, so he's a biologist. He's born in 19... Uh, 29, so he's 91 years old. Um, he's still actively publishing. It's it's just really great um, to see that he is um, so prolific as a scholar. But he's a biologist, a naturalist, and writer. Um, he's been called the Darwin of the 21st century, the father of sociobiology, which was a field he helped develop, um, the father of biodiversity. He's been listed as one of the 50 most influential scientists in the world today. Um, his specialty is myrmecology, the study of ants, um, on which he has been called the world's leading expert. Um, if you are a biology student, you have probably encountered this contribution. His greatest contribution to ecological theory was uh, the Mar MacArthur and Wilson Island biogeography uh, idea. And I actually have some images of that in here just to, to pay homage to that. Uh, he's a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize of of general nonfiction for these two books on human nature and the ants. Um, he was a three-time bestselling, uh, New York Times bestselling author for three other books that you can see written there. Um, he's written more than 30 books and published more than 430 scientific papers. Um, he's my hero. <laughs> he has received more than 150 prestigious awards and medals from around the world and has more than 40 honorary doctorates. It's just crazy to me. Um, Two species have been scientifically named in his honor. And if you're wondering, one is a bird and one is a bat. Um, the other question that you might have is who is Deborah Williams? <laughs> well, I tried to keep this similar to the bio I presented with um, for E.O. Wilson. So I was born February 20th, 1967 in Garden City, Kansas. I will be 54 in about three weeks. Um, I uh, am a lifelong resident of Kansas and a career educator. Uh, I currently serve as professor and chair of the Environmental Science and Sustainable Agriculture Department. I have been called a lifelong learner, a professional student, a graduate student emeritus, I actually call myself that, and a union advocate. I think that exact th word was thug. Um, I hold eight degrees, six advanced with one on the way, uh, and I've published broadly on topics including collective bargaining, Japanese uh, poetry and how that can be used as a tool for um, environmental education. I, I write a lot about Native American and Western scientific worldviews. Um, I look at the limitations of the scientific worldview uh, on studying metaphysically inclusive people. And most recently, like literally about three days ago, um, my paper on artificial intelligence um, and how that can be enhanced by indigenous wisdom was published. Um, so I call myself an interdisciplinary traveler, and I am in constant pursuit of the unity of knowledge, which is why this book um, appeals. Um, so I knew you would ask, and I was happy that Maureen went down the list, but um, of those degrees, again, there's just two in undergraduate life science and animal science from K-State. I have a master's in student counseling, a master's in ecology and evolutionary biology. The JD is from the KU School of Law, and I have certificates in natural resource and environmental law um, with that. I have a master's in curriculum and instruction, I have a master's in philosophy, a master's in indigenous studies, and I'm currently working on a PhD in cultural anthropology where I'm doing my work with um, indigenous peoples as students, stakeholders, and subjects of science. Um, so to frame this presentation a little bit, I should tell you that you're going to get a look at, or at least my look at E.O. Wilson's consilience, but you're also going to look at D.H. Williams' uh, views of consilience from time to time. 
Um, I thought it probably appropriate to start with a confession and a vivid memory that I had of um, my own educational journey and why in 1999, actually when I first encountered the book, it was published in 1998, um, I was a student in ecology and evolutionary biology, but what led me to that place was a somewhat circuitous route. Um, as many of you know, my first love was science, but it was not my only love. Um, and I, as most students are, are when they first enter uh, college as an undergraduate at K-State, I was um, a little, you know, unsure of what I wanted to major in really. I knew I, I was interested in science and animals and I thought about ecology and pre-veterinary medicine, but this conversation with a KSU advisor changed everything. It was in that conversation with this advisor that in revealing my uncertainty about what I really wanted to be when I grew up, I was given permission to explore everything that I was interested in. And so I, I, I often come back to that um, conversation and I think about it when I have opportunities to advise students myself. Um, it, a lot of times disciplines can be distilled down into the way that you look at things. Uh, and you might be interested in many things. Um, a concept from science that, that we learn very early on in biology is magnification and field of view using the microscope, which is a tool of uh, biological sciences. And so this phrase pops up a lot when things aren't clear, just adjust your focus or, you know, look at what the field of view, as you'll see me uh, talk about here in a second, uh, can be very metaphorically helpful uh, when you're looking for the next place to place a step. Um, so we learn about Louis and Hoke's microscope and uh, that led me into, when I found this little image, it led me into this um, um, discovery of the evolution of microscopy, which I've presented here for you. The point is we've come a long way and this particular simple tool in the 1600s opened the door to the way that we look at things as scientists, particularly as biological scientists. Um, so um, to dive a little bit deeper in the weeds, uh, uh, consistent with what I will critique Wilson as doing uh, in his book, um, I will present you with this um, image. And I tried to find the simplest kind of even cartoonish image of field of view, view to make my point. Um, you see over here a compound light microscope, which is a device that we would use in today's teaching labs. But it gives us the ability to magnify specimen that we, um, we are using. Um, and have the ability, uh, this particular one, like many in our labs, has the capability of magnifying an object up to a thousand times. Um, the field of view happens to be the maximum area visible when you're looking through a microscope uh, piece. But what I like to, to tell my students when I'm teaching about this and why it's relevant to what I'm going to say about consilience is, imagine if you're driving down a road and you see a car coming towards you. Um, you may not know at a great distance, like this first image here at 40 times magnification, um, really a lot about the detail of that, of that um, organism in this case, or specimen in this case, or the vehicle in my, my driving metaphor. As the car comes closer to you, or you come closer to the car, you start to get a sense of the color, the make, and the model, and you have a lot more uh, concrete information about the details of what you're seeing similar to increasing your magnification and adjusting your focus. By the time it gets really close to you and you're passing, you know, make, model, model color, you might see the bugs, you know, on the, on the windshield. Um, there's all kinds of detail that you can get when you look at a uh, specimen with an enhanced degree of magnification. And the metaphor here is, really comparable to what we, we experience as academics and disciplines. And what a lot of students will experience as they travel through um, their uh, field of, their fields or their, their choice of major. Um, so again, in keeping with the spirit of detail of E.O. Wilson, one early lab that we do looks at um, cell division. And since you, you know that Wilson is really interested in heredity, um, this is probably the simplest place that I can make this point about view and perspective and also give you an example of genetic information uh, in three simple slides. So we use this um, specimen root, alien root or onion uh, root tip um, to ultimately 
find a, a location. And you can see if you take a whole plant, um, you where we need to concentrate on the roots for the specimen over here on the, the far uh, right. Um, that even if we take a section of the root where we can expect there's growth occurring, there are zones where it's most likely and least likely to find cell division, which is the focus of that particular lab. Once we do that, if we take you know a little slice of the area that's known as a zone of cell division, and we prepare our slide and we adjust it appropriately, we can see happening within um, all of the recognized stages of mitosis or cell division. And so it's a really interesting um, way of thinking about you know levels of organization in life. It, the, the slide um, series here does. It also, I think, brings to focus some of what um, what Wilson is really um, reminding us of about if you're looking at explanations as he is for a unity of knowledge or a unity. Um, look at from an organismic perspective, transfer of information. One place where we see that all the time is through inherited traits. And so in this case, we're looking at um, chromosome um, movement within the root tip of an onion. So um, I, another time where I got an opportunity to encounter E.O. Wilson was in person. I was in a large audience in the lead center. This happened to be April 15, 2004. I found this uh, when I did a Google search to see if I could find um, the exact date he was here to put it into context of, again, his influence on my life. To me, this was a booster shot of consilience. Um, after first reading his book in approximately 1999 as an ecology and evolutionary biology student, I heard this lecture during my final months of law school. So I'm gonna go back real quickly to this. And by the time I heard, um, by the time I heard E.O. Wilson speak, I had already accumulated one, two, three, four, and I was about to accumulate my fifth degree. So I think by that point, um, the idea of consilience was really um, in, innate in me. I was very motivated to learn. And um, obviously reading his book in 1998 inspired me to, um, to look at other disciplines and, and find related concepts within. So what is consilience? Um, interestingly enough, it's not a term that he coined. Um, the next slide will, will remind us who, who did. But um, this, this definition is in his book early on, literally a jumping together of knowledge by the linking of facts and fact-based theory across disciplines to create a common groundwork of explanation. Um, keep in mind that E.O. Wilson is using the lens of a scientist. So again, it's all about how you look at things. And while he is well-read, and um, well versed in history and philosophy to some extent, he is a biologist. And in particular, he is using the lens in the language of evolutionary biology. Um, he tells us very late in the book, I'm, I'm surprised he put it that late in the book, is that science looks for four qualities in theories. So in his mission to search for unifying um, theories, um, I would think he would put that framework earlier in, um, in his message, but uh, keep in mind that he is a scientist, he's using the, the vocabulary and the lens and language of evolutionary biology, but he tells us, um, and I think it's around, depending on which tech, which book you have, because um, I have two and the pagination is slightly different for some reason, but um, parsimony, generality, consilience, and predictiveness is on page 198 of my hard copy in front of me, and we'll talk about how that comes up in the places where he's trying to show an extension into non-scientific disciplines, which is the point. Um, we well or well, well, well uh, was the first to coin this term in the 1840s. And that person's project was to find consilience among the scientists. Wilson's project is bigger than that. He's trying to find consilience beyond science and across what he calls the great branches of learning. He admits that this idea is not yet a science in and of itself. It's a worldview shared only by a few scientists and philosophers. But he, he tries to sell this to us as, as the strongest appeal being that um, the prospect of intellectual adventure um, occurs when you start to stray outside of the boundaries of your discipline. And the value of understanding the human condition might come with this higher degree, with a higher degree of certainty, if you start looking at things more holistically or comprehensively. 
And as I said here, say to, to you in brackets at the bottom, he had me from the phase from the phrase intellectual adventure. Um, so this is um, an image that you see pretty early in the book as well. And so these great branches of knowledge to Wilson was environmental policy, ethics, biology, and social science. And from my vantage point now reading the book, I'm happy to see that he considers these four the great branches of knowledge because I have a degree in law with, this, with emphasis in environmental law. I have a philosophy degree, master's degree with an emphasis in applied ethics, primarily bioethics, and then biology, ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, I have that uh, in my hand and, and I'm working right now on a social science, which is um, cultural anthropology. So if these are the four great branches of, of learning, I feel like I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty well set. I'm on this trajectory to understand what he's going to say uh, in the book. Um, and by the way, I asked if you guys uh, can at some point before we get to Q&A, if you can type in the chat, chat box your majors or your discipline area, that will be helpful to um, maybe our Q&A um, at the end. Um, so because it was convenient, because I know a lot of these, uh, these things, because I've acquired some of these um, degrees here, I looked at KU's descriptions of various disciplines that would fall along that, the, those routes within um, this great um, areas of branches of learning for Leopold. And I forgot to say here and here, as you move from these areas of content expertise toward the center, um, you are achieving consilience. And you're kind of at this frontier zone. You're in rugged terrain. You're on an intellectual adventure, um, but it's a place that's ripe, uh, uh, Wilson will say, and so will Williams uh, for interesting insights on um, any one and all of these, uh, these established disciplines. So what I've, um, I've, I've italicized in each of these descript descriptions is the phrases that they each use. And I think it's, it's remarkably uh, consistent that these fields, and I picked out anthropology, sociology, philosophy, law, environmental studies, and ecology and evolutionary biology, that they all purport to be broad thinking and one environmental studies purports, purports to be interdisciplinary and it certainly is. But look at the ways that each of these disciplines knowing, which I know some of you in the audience are experts or are disciplinary experts in each of, in some of these, um, you can look at these definitions that KU describes as the possible experience of a student pursuing these majors and ask yourself if, you would agree with the description, but most importantly, look at these places where anthropology, for example, describes itself as one of the most widely ranging of the academic disciplines. Um, sociology uh, purports to have to, to say that few fields have such broad scope. Um, philosophy says we ask the big important questions. Uh, KU Law tells us that uh, the three-year experience will transform you, and I can attest to that. It certainly will. Um, the environmental studies program is the one that claims to be interdisciplinary and ecology and evolutionary biology um, is promising to capture the breadth and depth of research and graduate education opportunities by providing opportunities in these three primary areas organized around the biology of organisms and how they develop, how they live, how they adapt and respond to change over time. So my my inspiration here is, or my, um, my hope is, is that if this is the case, then students within these disciplines will have room, will have, going back to my field of view metaphor, have space around the specimen or the disciplinary expertise and content that they're studying to engage in, in, in opportunities for conciliant dialogue. So um, here's another um, quote from Wilson. Um, he's He's claim, making a claim here about human nature. He's, he says there's a drive for unity and connection to wit people must belong to a tribe. They yearn to have a purpose larger than themselves. We are obliged by the deepest drives of the human spirit to make ourselves more than animated dust. We must have a story to tell about where we came from and why we are here. So here's this 21st century philosopher making a claim about human nature and it sounded familiar to me. It sounded like this guy. This guy, 
<laughs> fourth century Greek philosopher Aristotle is also making a claim about um, human nature. He's telling us that all men by nature desire to know. So when I first encountered them, I'm like, oh, he's telling us we're all scientists because that's what science, uh, the word science is derived from a Latin word that translates to know. Um, but he says a little bit more here about you know, how we take the light in our senses, particularly sight. Again, it's all about the way you look at things. And even when there is um, nothing is, is, we are not going to do anything with it. We prefer sight to almost anything else. The reason being, Aristotle says, that the senses make us know and brings to light many differences between things. Um, I used the same quote in another presentation quite a few years ago um, to make the point that sight can also help us see the many similarities between things. But I think it's cool sometimes to think about as in my own um, educational journey as I encounter something like this, something old uh, and provocative and something more recent um, that sounds similar how this 21st century scientist, how cool it would be if he could sit down and have a conversation with um, Aristotle and talk about these ideas. Um, so obviously Wilson had an opportunity to read Aristotle. Aristotle didn't have an opportunity to read Wilson, but you members of the audience have an opportunity to read both. And I highly encourage that you do. Um, another point I will make about this is that if this is the case that people must belong to a tribe and we're obliged to um, make more of ourselves than just animated dust, science alone can't get us there. And I think Wilson would be the first to admit that. Um, so he takes on you know, several different disciplines. And um, when we get to the end of the presentation, I'll offer some critiques. Um, but religion, he has to talk about, he has to talk about pre-enlightenment thinking. And this is a, a quote that really captured something I thought that was interesting. He said, still if history and science have taught us anything, it is that passion and desire are not the same thing as truth. The human mind evolved to believe in the gods. It did not evolve to believe in biology. Acceptance of the supernatural conveyed a great advantage throughout prehistory when the brain was evolving. Thus, it is in sharp contrast to biology, which is developed as a product of the modern age and is not under, underwritten by genetic algorithms. The uncomfortable truth is that these two beliefs are not factually compatible. As a result, those who hunger for intellectual and religious truth will never acquire both in full measure. And so again, in these brackets, that's me interacting with his words. I'm like, are they? Are they incompatible? Are we fated to never really acquire a, satisfac a satisfactory understanding of both? That reminded me of something else that I um, had been researching and that's an epistemology, an approach to science way of knowing that indigenous peoples use, particularly Native Americans use this. Uh, traditional ecological knowledge is localized knowledge. Uh, Native Americans um, start with spirituality at the core. Um, most of the time what you'll, I hear in my research, Native American scientists say is that they start from the place that the earth is sacred. Um, what's interesting about this particular image, and I've also used this before in presentations, that Western science is on their web. The starting place, the lens, may be to, to make central spirituality or a sacred earth you know, philosophy, but Western science fully intact is a, is a string on the web. So this idea that they're, they're potentially not compatible, it depends, I think, on um, the approach that you're taking. So Western science, and again, I've, I've written on the limitations of the Western scientific paradigm, particularly in um, discussion in, in study of indigenous metaphysically inclusive peoples like this um, particular image would uh, re relay um, can be problematic. And for the uh, more nerdy in the audience, um, if you get one copy of this presentation, I'll be happy to send you. I have a hyperlink here to a paper from which this um, image was derived. And that paper is a Native American scientist talking about again, some of the tensions and the problems of using this, I would argue, highly complementary approach to Western science. And one of, the, one of the things he identifies as being problematic is, is that Western science, once this 
kind of approach to be translated into Western scientific, um, uh, pa the paradigm of Western science. And that's not always easily um, achieved. And in this case, why, why would you? Um, if you have an intact, cohesive paradigm that works and there's lots of evidence that it does, why would there be the motivation uh, to force fit, to bootstrap um, this particular approach into another? Um, so what I'm trying to do is get people to talk to each other and, and, and kind of engage um, conversation myself and contribute to the discourse that traditional ecological knowledge seems to integrate two incompatible ways of knowing and illustrates how this exchange of ideas, this, this movement towards the center in that consilience model that, that, um, that uh, Wilson presents to us can actually be uh, very beneficial. And this particular presentation and my thoughts about this was around uh, environmental problem solving, how indigenous views can be helpful in environmental problem solving. Um, so by um, examining philosophical and spiritual aspects of organisms and their relationships to the environment, traditional ecological knowledge becomes a metaphysical extension of the Western scientific paradigm. So I had have some other thoughts about consilience in my own discipline areas. Um, I asked this question a while ago and I've actually been thinking through this um, for several years. Um, is there an ethical methodology, um, a rational decision-making process in science, philosophy and law? And so I have this model, again, I would say, I would, I would give the same disclaimer that, Lee, that uh, that Wilson did with his consilience idea about extending consilience across, not containing it just to sciences, but across into other disciplines, that this is a work, this is an idea and process. But what I have is, what we have established is in terms of an evidentiary continuum with science from hypothesis theory to scientific laws and a rational decision-making scheme that has been well borne out over time, if you, if you pull an example of an ethical theory, you know, like in this, I kind of based it on uh, Kantian ethics, can we establish a similar trajectory where, you know, you take, you know, Kant's categorical imperative. Can I claim that, you know, that I always act in such a way that my will can become a universal law as an individual value? Can I extend that to the formula for humanity, the second formulation, and ultimately to something that's very, uh, generalizable to all of humanity and the kingdom of ends. So I don't know, I was playing with that and I thought, wow, there's a lot of common language between science and, and ethics with reason-driven approaches, rationally, a central pro property of man being reason. And I, I thought, hey, maybe there's something to work with here. And then over here, I have this idea about law, about perhaps even legal procedural methodology uh, can, can, you know, be uh, depicted uh, in a similar way, because guess what? In law, what are we trying to do? We're trying to, in our case holdings, establish precedent, which can be um, generalized to similar like cases. That's called stare decisis in law, so that you get at the end of the day, you know, a equitable application of law, um, re regardless of time and place, if the facts, you know, fit the fit the scenario, fit the, the, the rule of law. So I don't know, I'm playing with that as my own kind of journey through consilience with discipline areas that I know. Um, and which brings me to this uh, important quote by Wilson. Um, again, he's a biologist, he's an evolutionary biologist. He's gonna put a real big premium on, um, on uh, evolutionary uh, impacts um, as in this case, how our thinking has evolved. But he tells us that the cost of scientific advance is the humbling recognition that reality was not constructed to be easily grasped by the human mind. This is a cardinal tenet of scientific understanding. Our species and its ways of thinking are a product of evolution, not the purpose of evolution. So I, I, I love that because again, it's like kind of putting evolutionary thinking within its own place. You know, it's not that we can look at human, the human mind or the, or the human brain, I think is really what he's talking more about um, as being the, the ultimate um, outcome of evolution that our species and the way we think are a product of, not the purpose of 
can attach, you know, some intentionality, I guess, to the evolutionary uh, natural selection scheme. So an obvious question would be, even at this point, where do we go from here? Um, so he's telling us the only way to unite the great branches of learning and to end what he calls culture wars is to view boundaries between uh, them as not territorial lines, but as broad and mostly unexplored terrain awaiting cooperative entry from both sides. Here's that intellectual adventuring again. And, he's, and he claims that, and I agree, that the misunderstandings arise from ignorance of the terrain, not from a fundamental difference in mentality. It's not for a lack of capacity that, um, and you'll see some of the examples that he gives in my upcoming slides, that sociologists and philosophers and uh, physicists and biologists um, kind of have their own zones. The, 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 it seems that there's an opportunity to interact and to engage into this um, unknown terrain, but it's, it's not something that's part of um, at least up to the point when he was writing, and I can say of my own experience as a student in science and ecology, it wasn't typical to study philosophical thought in your ecology and evolutionary biology uh, pro program. You, you take intentionally take courses within these other fields, but it, it's always kind of that. It's this area that's outside of the, the core curriculum, and this idea of tearing down these walls and these boundaries um, might be um, very, very useful. So I think this is Wilson's call to action, or perhaps it's just mine. It's time to go intellectually off-roading. It's time to get out of, off the script of only taking courses in our majors. Um, you know, push back on that. Ask as to whether, you know, the courses that you have are in the lineup, if there's flexibility maybe to, um, to explore something else. And even if the answer is no, explore something else anyway. You'll, you'll be happy for it. So going back to this again, if, if I was in front of you and I had all your majors in front of me, I would say, okay, take this. And it's only a template. This is Wilson's idea about the so-called great branches of learning. Maybe you represent one of those boxes. If not, you know, replace the box with your own discipline area. And think about, you know, if you decide, okay, there's somebody that's uh, literature or, or English, um, put yourself in the environmental policy box and keep everything else the same. Or what I would like to do if I had more time and I was, again, I think this works better when you're real time interactive, um, you know, have people in groups and, and talk through an issue and see how cool it is and to reach this, um, you know, understanding, this consilient understanding by talking across disciplines. So some of the disciplines that he attempts to, um, to uh, find a pathway for science to intersect with um, is the social sciences. So the so science and social science nexus, and keep in mind there's, a, there's whole chapters on all of these. So I only picked out a few things that I thought were provocative or things that I could speak about. Um, he talks a lot about natural history. Uh, and how natural history generates available knowledge across the organizational levels um, with his conversations about or with his chapter on social sciences. Of course, he talks about sociobiology, which is a field that he you know, was instrumental in helping to develop joint project by biologists and social science. And they were examining the biological basis of social behavior in all organisms. And, and why wouldn't he? He's an ant biologist. He's, a, he's an ecologist um, and he's, you know, taking something that he knows very well and looking for comparable um, theoretical basis of un biological basis of understanding uh, behavior in, in Homo sapiens. Um, with regard to the social sciences, he says there's four bridges that have already been built um, to provide disciplinary intersections, cognitive neuroscience, human behavioral genetics, evolutionary biology, and environmental science. Um, and if you think about it, if you happen to be in sociology or sociology major, think about ways in which the environment uh, comes up in your class. Hopefully environmental science and sustainability is coming up in all of your classes, but um, the four bridges uh, that he talks about here, you can see this you know, cognitive neuroscience, human behavioral genetics, and you, have, you can see the science piece and you can see the social science piece uh, sometimes is, easily as just reading the names. 
Um, but he, he, he provides this foundation by saying that the natural environment, hence natural history, is the theater in which the human species evolved and to which its physiology and behavior are finally adapted. Neither human biology nor the social sciences can make full sense until their worldviews take account this unyielding framework. So his way of, of getting this nexus between social science and science is to use natural history uh, and environment um, as the avenue of the pathway in. The arts and science nexus, I thought this was interesting because he, ad he admits that this is the most interesting challenge um, in finding consilience between science and the arts. Um, he focuses on particularly on interpretive arts, the interpretive nature of arts, and argues that it's more powerful when braided together with history, biography, personal confession, and science. And um, he talks about how arts are the expression of the human condition and calls into play all of the senses of evoking both order and disorder. Um, he has a whole chapter on, on gene cultural co gene culture co-evolution, and he argues that he believes that's the underlying process by which the brain evolved and the arts originated. So again, as a biologist, and if you're trying to find um, the unifying thread throughout disciplines, he's returning to the biological basis and locating it here, in, in my view, within the brain. Um, in both the arts and science, the program Brain seeks elegance which is the parsimonious and evocative description of pattern to make sense out of confusion and detail. And I won't take time to read it, but there's a really cool quote um, that he includes. And again, this is an approximate because it's different in the two versions of the books that I have right here at home. Um, around page 219, there's this quote, and certainly with under the um, chapter on art, um, that he quotes this guy who's a musician and a mathematician, and he talks about that very thing, which I think is really kind of cool. Um, ethics, religion, and science nexus. Oh, there's a lot. He, he wrote a lot about it. It's hard to pick out you know, what to include. Uh, and it's, it's also a very um, interesting uh, project to, to, to attempt to find this nexus, because on, on the surface, it would seem that this would be the most difficult one. But he he starts with the proclamation that he himself is an empiricist, you know, shocker, we, we kind of figured that out along the way. He also claims to be a deist, and he defines that as belief in the possibility of a cosmological God. So another way of thinking about Wilson is, is he's not an atheist. He would, this possibility of a cosmological God would make him, you know, maybe an, an agnostic. He does, however, reject theism, which is the belief of the existence of a biological God who directs organic evolution and intervenes in, in human affairs. He believes, again, that that's dispelled by biology and by the brain sciences. And he uh, facetiously claims that this, uh, to work out whether there's a possibility of a cosmological God, he's going to leave that to the astrophysicists. Um, so he starts down this road by examining to po the possible origin of ethics and tying it to religion, which is not an uncommon thing to do, particularly if you are a, a scientist and you're not formally trained in, in philosophy, that's a logical place to start. So two possibilities that he, he writes out for us is, is that um, ethics could be derived from religion, so it's externally derived, or it's a human construct. It's something that's internally derived. We, we make up ourselves as a species. So he has these two summary phrases, I believe in the independence of moral values, whether from God or not, or I believe that moral values come from humans alone, God's another story. Um, so he starts this out there, and then ultimately, again, his project is just to look for consilience. So the consilience approach, um, he thinks, is reflected in transcendentalism. He says that's the holy grail of natural law using the holy grail of natural law to validate ethics. And so whether there's a lot here, I'll let you um, read through it, but using Aquinas' uh, Summa Theologica as um, a non-secular religious view of natural law and comparing that to sec secular views, um, he believes that both um, camps of moral reasoning can arrive at the same place with the so-called self-evident um, you know, powerful self-evident self rules that you see worked out in natural law. Um, so 
again, he's a biologist, he's an evolutionary ecologist. Um, why would ethics, what's the utilitarian, what's the utility of ethics? And uh, I started to say utilitarian. Um, I, will, I will say just as a matter of what's the usefulness of um, ethics in communal organisms? Um, how a ecologist might look at that and tie it back to heredity is um, this kind of group cooperation. And again, he studies bees, humans are a social organism. Um, so how, how he, he makes this um, kind of move uh, to the consilience between science and ethics is, is um, this, heritable, this heritable moral aptitude. Um, you tie that with history and on the cooperative, co uh, what's out there about cooperation between individuals. We know that cooperative, cooperation generally um, allows organisms to sur survive longer and produce more offspring. So they're more fit in the biological uh, realm. It is to be expected in the course of evolutionary history. He says that genes predisposing people towards cooperation and cooperative behavior would have come to predominate in the human population as a whole. So again, he's trying to find a genetic in this case or a um, inherited <clears throat> re uh, trait that um, explains why we have ethics at all <clears throat> within, um, within our group living organisms. Um, so again, a really distilled view of everything he says in that chapter is it's in our biological best interest to cooperate. Ethics constrains us uh, to refrain from those things that we ought not do uh, within the individual or within the group. Um, I almost took another pathway into another um, another writer that I really enjoy reading, which is Aldo Leopold, who says something very similarly about similar about ethics and um, you know on the buffet of of possible things that we can do, there are things that we ought not. And he, of course, is looking specifically at application to the environment. But if ethics is within group living organisms as a mechanism to constrain you know, our actions in furtherance of you know, cooperative behaviors that, that secure fitness, our survival and reproductive success, there you have your um, consilient move in a nutshell. Um, he, I, I'm sure the, the ethics um, majors and professors in the audience will love this one. He ultimately uh, concludes that you know, there's a great deal of, of serious thinking that needs to be done in the future to navigate some of our, our major challenges. And um, ultimately he concludes that ethics is everything. Um, I'm gonna look at the time. Ooh, I gotta speed up a little bit. There's a few more things to say here. The other appeal to this is it's a guide to major discovery. Again, going back to this idea of ethics. Um, if you think of ethics as, as constraint or restraint, um, some might think, some in, in certain disciplines might think that you know, this, um, this prescribed you know, view that you're trying to find connection is uh, limiting. And he's saying, absolutely not. Um, oops, back. <laughs> uh, it doesn't imprison our creativity, it expands our creativity. And I love this part of his quote. Um, the right answer to a trivial question is also trivial, but the right question, even when insoluble in exact form, is a guide to major discovery. And so it will ever be in the future excursions of science and imaginative flights of the arts. So I go back to what he was saying from the beginning. You know, I've got this idea. I'm going to riff off of consilience that we will, or well, whatever, however you pronounce his name, um, you know, was, was crafting about uh, unity of thinking among science. And he's taking it into the rugged terrain of social science and the arts and psychology. And um, he's finding that, okay, while it's not, it may not be perfect, it might not be soluble, um, it might be insoluble in that form, it's still worth moving through um, these ideas and, and thinking through what it could mean if you actually get to a place where you see um, those connections. Um, the final chapter should appeal to all of the environmental science students and professors in the room. It's really an, an urgent call uh, for environmental advocacy and actions. Call, it's, it's a call, uh, Leopold-like for, a, this, his is a conservation ethic more so uh, than a land ethic, but he takes a serious look at big environmental challenges, including you know, biodiversity loss, 
habitat destruction and climate change. And he leaves us with probably one of his most, most uh, well-quoted quotes um, about the kind of the danger of, of, of not um, being a consilient thinker. I believe that in the process of locating new avenues of creative thought, we will also arrive at an existential conservatism. Uh, it is worth asking repeatedly, what are our deepest roots? We are, it seems, old world catarine primates, brilliant emergent animals defined genetically by our unique origins, blessed by our newfound biological genius and secure in our homeland if we wish to make it so. What does it all mean? This is what it all means. <laughs> to the extent that we depend on prosthetic devices to keep ourselves in the biosphere alive, we will render everything fragile. To the extent that we banish the rest of life, we will impoverish our own species for all time. And if we should surrender our genetic nature to machine-aided ratiocination and our ethics and art and our very meaning to a habit of careless discursion in the name of progress, imagine ourselves godlike and absolved from our ancient heritage, we will become nothing. So I think that's a very powerful uh, statement to make. Um, another great sage of his time, to recap, might say it this way. Folk, Dan Fogelberg tells us that there's a place in the world for a gambler. There's a burden only he can bear. Um, and he sees. Again, remember, it's all about the way you look at things. There is a place in the world for a biologist, for a sociologist, for a philosopher, and what Wilson is telling us, there's also a place in the world for an interdisciplinary scholar. And that place is right here and right now. Um, I've used this quote. In fact, I used it in the paper that just published. Um, we are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. The world henceforth will be run by synthesizers, people able to put together the right information at the right time, think critically about it, and make important choices wisely. So <laughs> um, I know uh, my English professor colleagues was probably would be happy to see this, um, that um, I'm providing a critique and praises. It's, it's you know, I, I'm, I'm here because I truly believe that this is a great book, but it's not without flaws. And if you go out there, there's been enough time, there are many book reviews and, and others will say um, some things that are similar to what I'm going to say, but also maybe say it in a little bit different way. There's one that I found that there were parts of, of this guy's um, review that was pretty harsh, um, but I pulled out a couple of things for balance. And he says, and this person was apparently also a biologist, but he said, Wilson's new book is ambitious, vague, and philosophically naive. And then later on, he says, all in all, it's a gentle, enjoyable read. I agree. <laughs> so I worked through some of the chapters, not all of it, just to hit some of the highlights. Uh, remember in chapter one, he talks about this concept of the Ionic enchantment, which is actually a, a reference to a, a, philo a philosopher, um, this idea of um, that was coined by a physicist, um, Thales of Miletus and Ionia in sixth century BC. And that thinker believed that, you know, the material uh, essence of everything was water. So you don't have to look into 1998 or even what 1840s that uh, we will um, presented the definition of consilience to find consilient thinking. Um, so I would agree with this critique that in some places, especially in his early chapters, he, he dives way too deep in the weeds <laughs> with explanations of scientific content. Uh, but that appealed to me. When I first read this as a, as a graduate student of ecology, I loved every word. Um, in other places, and here's my uh, modification of, of Orr's critique, he's appropriately vague, and he wi he's wisely deferential to the future generations to kind of fill in the gaps in the areas that he really can't speak to. Keep in mind, he's not a formally trained philosopher and likely wasn't learning philosophy in his classes as a myrmecologist, nor was I um, many decades later as a student in ecology at KU. Um, so in chapter six on the mind, yeah, it was funny when I started rereading it, I read up to chapter six in one setting. It was like, there was like a hundred pages of, of so, and I was like, this is awesome. And I get to the chapter on the mind and it left me somewhat disappointed. I mean, I actually put it down and came back to it and started at that point because the detail in biology in the beginning had me worried. I thought he was going to make this really common mistake of conflating mind and, and brain. He didn't. 
<laughs> this was one of the places where he talked a lot about brain biology, but probably not enough about philosophy of mind. Um, and as I have here in fairness, you know, he's working with limited information, even on brain, um, understanding of brain biology at the time. But um, there's been a lot of work and some right here at KU, or I say here at KU, I'm in Lawrence. So uh, here in town, um, we have some philosophers over at KU Philosophy who are working on some really cool um, uh, angles to the philosophy of mind and memory. So shout out to professors Maley and uh, Robbins. <laughs> uh, in chapter seven, uh, genes and culture, again, he appropriately distances himself from genetic determinism, which some of you know, he got really crit criticized for that in some of his earlier writings. Um, he's looking for a unifying basis through natural history and heritable explanatory traits um, and epigenics, which is that kind of nature uh, and biological environment and biological uh, nexus. Um, he finds natural history to be the conduit that would link science and the social science. He finds natural law and evolutionary biology, uh, particularly be behavioral ecology as conduits for linking science to ethics and even goes as far as to say our survival depends on it. And if you don't think he says it here, he says it in some more recent uh, books that are uh, out there for you to, to peruse. Um, so I guess in summary, I would say, you know, as well read and as brilliant as he obviously is, I think his lack of formal knowledge in some disciplines shows at times. Um, there's similar critiques out there for Aldo Leopold with the land ethic, which is another one of my favorites. It's also written by a very broad thinking scientist without formal training in philosophy. I would agree with Wilson. I think that the world will turn uh, to um, the synthesizers. You cannot synthesize something without a deep foundational knowledge of the areas being synthesized. Otherwise, you're left with some of these voids and this vagueness that he's criticized of doing in, in this book. So Consilience is an ambitious project that invites us to, to journey outside our interdisciplinary or our disciplinary comfort zones. I think he has a destination in mind clearly, but the journey seems to be just as important to, important to him. Um, Wilson and me and Williams, um, would have an important message for scholars and students in the audience. Um, look for these interdisciplinary intersections, even where you think that they can't possibly occur. You will find them and they will intrigue you, You'll be intrigued by them. I mean, whole careers uh, can be made, <laughs> I think, on these frontiers uh, between um, the subject matter specialties um, that are currently recognized. So it's okay to follow a well-paved path but also give yourself permission, like my K-State advisor did many years ago, to go intellectually off-roading <laughs> into the rugged terrain. So with that, I will stop and ask if there are any thoughts or questions or comments. If you just wanna type any questions in the chat, we'd like to thank Deb for all, uh, this is, there's a lot here and there's a lot connecting actually to other things that I know are brewing um, across campus. I'm looking, are there any questions? I'm gonna stop share real quick so I can see them. Oh, I have a lot of chats. I bet that's a lot of the majors. So I have biology, wildlife biology, uh, business finance. So that's awesome. Liberal arts, ESOL, Sociology, biochemistry, English, 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 linguistics. That's pretty cool. So if you don't have any questions for me, I'm going to ask questions of you. <laughs> okay, we are right at one o'clock. Okay. So. okay, I guess I won't, I'll, I'll hold my questions until I, I see you again then. Thank you so much for um, giving me the opportunity to talk about this. I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you, Deb. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Yes, we want to thank the, our partners, which uh, Deb already acknowledged, the CoLab, the people from uh, Video Services, and we would like to invite you back in a month to hear uh, Marilyn Center talking on the Anansi Boys by Neil Gaiman, and in April to hear uh, Andrea Broomfield talk about Waiting for Godot, or yes. Um, what did I forget, Michael? You nailed it. It's perfect. Right. 
Thank you very much for coming and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you again, Deb.